Indie Comic Union presents Quilt. A collaboration between the comic makers of the Union, an original story set upon the dying patchwork world of the Quilt. Join us on the adventure, not just in the comic, but in the making of it, on YouTube, Instagram, and at IndieComicUnion.com. Welcome, everyone. This is a Draw Jam, where we're working on a group project called The Quilt. It's a big, expansive comic book world that includes many different art styles, and the process of watching it being made is almost part of the draw here. This world, while it's still in its infancy stages, is really growing, really expanding, really drawing a lot of interest from everyone involved. Uh, Bradley Littlejohn, AKA the Seahorsey, has been super instrumental in like pushing a lot of this off the ground along with other artists as well. Uh, Bradley, what, how do you see this project moving forward? What's your, what's your take on it right now? Uh, I've been impressed with everybody jumping on board and going with this mad scheme. And right now I'm really optimistic that it's just going to have a life of its own. Um, I'm watching everybody get excited about telling their own stories in this world. And so I think w the initial idea that John and I had, John Osborne, who's not here today, uh, was just this little thing and we crossed our fingers and we went, I hope people want to jump into this and it sure seems like they are. There's a lot of interest. So it's been great. So today we're going to be working on a setting for this comic book. It's called The Crater and I've got a little intro about it here. Okay, so The Crater is an alien oasis set in a wasteland patch of the quilt. So this is a barren, desolate area. Everything we're drawing here is going to take place on this alien planet. And uh, the last video draw jam brainstorm sessions, people came up with stuff like goose fruits. That's a barnacle tree that releases fruits that are surfable. You can kind of see how crazy this world is getting alien plant life. And eventually, if we have time, we're going to get to some sort of Rube Goldberg style contraptions around the Critter's treehouse. So let's see how much we get done today. So this week, we're working on the, the Crater Critters, which is really hard for me to say. And I wish that I had chosen a different name at this point, because I don't want to say Critter Craters all the time. <laughs> but, uh, but these guys are... Uh, where we're at this week so that we can establish the look of their world. Now, a lot of this comes based on Jink Beast's amazing visualization of the patchwork planet of the quilt, which she did this week. And we got to show off with the Barbarian episode um, where we were doing some draw jams from last week. We should have that up tomorrow morning. Um, but here's something that came in today and blew my mind. Robbie, you really knocked it out of the park with this one. This Thanks, is, man. Yeah, this is the crater. So the crater is the place that the, uh, the critters reside. And on the planet quilt, it's hardship after hardship. The gods have brought together all these disparate chunks of planets from throughout the galaxy, brought them together for this uh, source of entertainment for them to watch suffering kind of unfold is what we think at this point. And uh, the crater is an exception to that. Whereas all these people have been struggling, people are kind of blocked out by this caldera and you can see Robbie even imagined this inaccessible place. And inside of that is this oasis where those critters are able to um, have a softer life than everybody else on, on Quilt. So that's going to give an interesting story for us to tell as we discuss these characters uh, having to learn of hardship and adversity that heretofore they haven't been exposed to. So jumping into this, John uh, um, designed Apennon and the Starbreakers, those hard like space knights that have kind of descended into barbarian um, lifestyle. I thought if I kick this off, I'll do a little bit of design work on these critters. And the first two that came to mind, and we threw these out, I think within 30 minutes, J um, John and I had Apennon, Sliver, and Tar here, all kind of worked out into their versions. And from there, they've just come, been coming to life. This is Tar. And uh, we haven't even assigned gender to either of them yet at this point. I don't know, that may come out in story devices later, but not yet. And uh, here's uh, Connor Cottontail pulled out this, uh, this one with a tar. <laughs> was kind of fascinated with the backpack. 
and uh, what's going to happen with that backpack that uh, they wear. Now, there's five critters in total. And this is one that um, Kevin Curley, Buckets of Size, was uh, able to pull together. We haven't even named this character yet, but we know they have a story arc in store for them. And this is kind of a rough design. I'm excited today if anybody wants to see and, and kind of riff off of ideas like this to um, see what works. Is this works X or Y? Us. What's that? Is this X or Y? This one would be X is where, where we're thinking about this one. So this character has a story arc that kind of goes, um, goes awry at the very beginning of the book. We see them uh, fall into this, what's called the drain and we'll get there. And they have Call this kind Zubu. of journey. What's that? Call him Zubu. Zubu, I like that. Right there. <laughs> we need to get that like, in the notes here. Zubu. Yeah, let me take that down real quick. Yeah, like that's X -U -B -U. good. X-U-B-U. S-U-B-U. <laughs> X-U. Oh, X-U, sorry. X-U-B-U yeah. for Kevin Curley's character. Yeah. That's another <laughs> tongue twister. <laughs> We're all about tongue twisters here. <laughs> this one, Matt, you, I don't know if you have any input. You drew this one. Uh, there's a character hanging out with Tar and yeah. could be a great one for the one of the two undefined characters that we have, the X or the Y, as they're called right now. Cool. What were you thinking? Um, yeah, I just got, I was riffing off of Tar and kind of thinking what would, what would feel right, you know, hanging out with this group. Um, and yeah, uh, it's funny that the fruit really looks like that uh, image from the barnacle tree coming up. Doesn't it? Yeah, it just really flies. <laughs> and I didn't, I really didn't know that. I, I hadn't seen that image before. It's that um, sixth sense that you have. Yeah, but I have, if it's okay, I have, um, I have a little new critter idea I'll try and jam out tonight just to Oh, cool. just to throw some possibilities out there. But I think this is a kind of a cool one and I'd love to see what other people have too. Yeah. So are all of the trees in this world so far kind of curly Dr. Seuss style trees? Like they, they have those curlicues most of the time? That's something, we, yeah, that the, it seems to suggest itself because Robbie did one. I didn't have time to get that one incorporated, but Robbie had one but... this, this morning. <laughs> hey man, I spent the whole morning <laughs> making videos and rendering stuff. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but author Robbie's about, idea definitely yeah. also had that curly kind of alien. I like I like the idea of it being like a Dr. Seuss kind of thing. Yeah. Actually, oh yeah. Now that it's I mean, mentioned. I mean, that's just like totally awesome for me. But I think it could be anything still. I you know I think if if something comes out. Um, well, this I, is just one place. Be, yeah. Sure. Yeah. You know, you could do. You could have the. Um, if this is like the start of their adventure, um, have like the the home that they live in be like a fantastic. Dr. Seuss area and like the more that they kind of travel the world it gets like a little bit darker and a little bit more intimidating mm -hmm. oh yeah it's for sure like that and we'll I don't even know if we'll have time to get to that today but their uh -huh. treehouse in the script about halfway through um uh the character Y is able to set off this kind of Rube Goldberg contraption of you know like a big elaborate mouse trap that fights back against the um the, the bruise black and so if you peek at the script later on you'll see that it's kind of built to have that sense of of cartoon wonder and old school cartoon stuff yeah. can hopefully get jammed in there by everybody in those few panels. And hopefully we'll get a circle around to that again later on. Hmm. Yeah. So uh, you mentioned the bruise black. Uh, yeah. I hope I said that right. So <laughs> why is going to set off a mousetrap Rube Goldberg style design against sort of a threat that's coming into the crater? Yeah, that's kind of one of the challenges of the script uh, to uh, trying to bring in that, you know, the, one of John and I, our goals was to diversify and have a lot of different comic traditions involved in the script, uh, all the way from serious superhero stuff and uh, uh, horror story traditions, but also some of that toon stuff uh, gets thrown in there too. And cool. that's one example of that is that Rube Goldberg machine fighting back against that Bruce Black. And even um, sort of that Tolkien-esque darkness. He has some illustrations with the tall trees and things. There's some yeah. visualizations of stuff like that with the bruised black just bursting forth out of, out of that style. And I think, Matt, you kind of exist in a tradition that often reminds me of that. Your illustration style has a lot in common with uh, Tolkien. If nothing else, just the Thanks. way he held the brush. And stuff. Very true. And Very those true. Lines. Yeah. Oh, man. Thank you. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I kind of like the idea of calling it the bruise, B R O O Z E. Yeah. Oh yeah, that works too. Oh, yeah, that's good. A lot of a lot of my thinking of, of hyphenating the black yeah. in there was just to make it a truly distinct name that I knew if I sure. did a Google search, it wasn't going to come up with somebody else's thing. And 
Right. And oftentimes we get into. Yeah. Oh, I, um, I know. I do Google searches every time I have a, what I think is a good name, and and invariably, <laughs> you know, yeah. one out of a thousand tries, I'm like, yes, <laughs> I've got one. <laughs> yeah. I, that, I was um, I've After the up. late 90s, you just can't use the letter X anymore. They're all taken, anything with an X in it. <laughs> well, and when you think about being in the encyclopedia or in the, the, uh, the store too, you don't want to be in the X section because <laughs> it's extremely big too. So. <laughs> well, we were talking about Y, how about Yego for name? Yego, that's a good one. On that point, I'll show another slide that we have. Um, the one on the far left by Jink Beast uh, was another submission that was quite lovely. Mm -hmm. um, I, she helped me make some icons for the website and uh, in doing so she developed that character herself for Y and she even built it kind of with the Y as part of the shape of it so <laughs> Yego kind of rolls with that, uh, that, that look with the horns and, and shape of Y even. <laughs> I really like that character. Yeah and on that note Connor also kind of riffed mm -hmm. on that uh, uh, Jink Beast design. You see the one on the far right there um, has those horns that kind of play off it. It's kind of a cool, also Dr. Susie kind of um, employment of the horns like that. It's cool. I like yeah. how he, he ran with Thunk's legs being kind of like, you know, slithery, like yeah. tentacles or whatever. Yeah, that'd be interesting to draw um, him moving through the, uh, the, uh, the scenery. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. And at that point, the only other thing I really wanted to talk about before we jump into kind of hanging out and drawing was um, a breakdown sheet. People keep asking about the potential of the characters, what their intention is with them. And so when I write, I tend to think in terms of a cast, most of the things I do have a cast and I like to see how that, that cast interacts. And so I tend to create a story journey for each of those characters so that I can then track how they're going to, to move across that grid. Um, it's something I ripped off from Alan Moore. Uh, if you've ever looked, search the web, look for how he breaks down things like Watchmen, how he tells a complex story. Uh, you'll see some graph paper grids that he'll do them in ledgers and things um, where he'll track the character's journey through uh, transformations that the character goes in their story arc and mm -hmm. uh, how they interact across the, the issues of a comic. This is a very, very simple version of that because I just want to do a very simple story with you guys. But um, you can see how I broke down all those the characters and how there's room for X and Y to get uh, further developed here. I'm gonna turn on the laser pointer and go full teacher here. Yep. <laughs> so you can see um, like with X here, X's transformation really goes from being fearless at the beginning to fear induced, um, being stuck down in the tunnels. And we'll see more of that as we roll along. Um, same thing with Y, the character that we still have to really do some cool design decision making about. Um, it, it represents a sense of hope and optimism that gets transformed into a sense of hopelessness. Um, but those two characters, Tar and Sliver, they break out really well as a, as a team. Um, and they move from be, uh, Tar being kind of self-absorbed and uh, scared to becoming more of the magical helper and becoming a visionary of sorts, a mystical character. Whereas Sliver's journey is from being very passive to being very active and realizing that very typical hero's journey. I thought, how cool to have this very unassuming character be someone that finds their voice and goes on that heroic journey. You know, mm -hmm. it's a kind of a Lloyd Alexander, Tehran Wanderer kind of experience that way. And a cute sweater. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm sad Drew's not here. Drew had a lot of leadership about the idea of elements and the uh, elemental relationships. So maybe I've talked long enough. Maybe we'll just kind of move forward and pick up the elements sometime in a conversation when Drew's here because uh, he's our master of elements. Hi, I'm the author bot. I draw Chaos Engine and Nemo 3000. My Twitch stream, Drawing Before the Baby Wakes Up, airs Tuesdays and Thursdays, 7 a.m. Eastern time. Hey, I'm Matt Flux. Um, you can find me on Instagram at MattDrawsDND. Um, happy to be here. Uh, hi, I'm Brian, creator of Grublins, Crime Killer, and Bounty Bob. Uh, you can find my work at OneOnlyComics.com and on Instagram at OneOnlyComics with underscores instead of spaces. Hey, I'm Robert Hamill. Uh, you can find me at rhamillart on Instagram. I'm a comic artist in Macon, Georgia. I draw using both traditional methods and digital. 
Uh, I draw superhero and horror comics. Look for my original comic, Promordian, coming soon. Oh, hi, I'm I'm Gotham, um, but uh, you, I'm normally a podcaster, but I'm just recently uh, finally chasing my dream of being a indie comic creator. Uh, you can follow me on Instagram at pulp to pixel, and also on Twitter at pulp to pixel, um, and also you can follow my different comic book podcasts at pulp to pixel. Dot com. I'm Bradley Littlejohn, a.k.a. The Seahorsey. I make the comics Wiltworthy and Galact Opera. Uh, you can find those at bradleylittlejohn.com or by subscribing at uh, Instagram at The Seahorsey. So here's a uh, picture that Robbie did earlier in the day that captures what's what with uh, the, the crater. And it kind of gives you a sense of scale. Um, I, I would say uh, I'm in my... It's that 80s cartoon zoom in. You know, establishment <laughs> <Yeah>. shot. <laughs> That's awesome. Meanwhile, at the Hall of Justice. Exactly. <laughs> Those are very Eternia colors. But I think it's, I think it's all, you know, like, just how you feel about it right now, too. Like, get into it. Yeah, you know? very little of this, I think, has been really, really, really nailed down. Like, there's stuff that's been attached with push pins, but nothing's been nailed down yet. Yeah, and it's cartoon logic too. There are things that won't scale and won't have to scale, because um, when you, you you hold them up and start thinking about them, they just create all those narrative hitches, you know. Yeah, <laughs> it's like if you think about the Lord of the Rings too hard, it starts to fall apart. Or you think about uh, uh, distances in space travel and how why things in Star Wars take instants or you know long journeys. You know, once we start to uh, accumulate the- too much realism, it wrecks it. What's the classic thing? Is that a parasex, um, when it's used in Star Wars, it's not a measurement of distance, it's a measurement of time or, or something. No, it is yeah. a measurement of distance, not time. But because it's parasex, he thinks it's time. Uh, so in reality, it just means that the Millennium Falcon has like a really good navigational computer or something. Yeah. Like, like they're sort of like, yeah, it, it doesn't matter. Just make it up, you know, keep going along. People, people are buying it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, we box ourselves in, you just keep rolling with it. So, uh, anybody, anybody do anything cool this week? Uh, you know, I'm just trying to make conversation. <laughs> I'm thinking we need music. I am. Cats and boots and cats and boots and cats and boots and cats. I started a um, uh, Photoshop Illustrator classes um, for my degree program uh, this week, so that was nice. Uh, cool. I. Uh, I'm doing a full load this semester, so I'm going to see how well I can do that with my teaching schedule. (laughs) But uh, we'll see. And then uh, I think all the materials for my inking class just arrived, so I'm really kind of excited for that too. Nice. So I think it's just he's it's just lots of pre-penciled stuff to to ink. So. So do they send you like fancy inking supplies or do you just Oh, you you buy those although i pre i bought those already i i like you know i'm i'm in it to like as much as i'm happy to learn the digital styles and stuff i want to like i want to learn like old school comic making you know like as, as, pens. Uh, oh yeah 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 like i i mean you know winsor newtons and um I'm doing a lot of like the Japanese brush pens, so. Mm-hmm. I, I love those things. Uh, yeah. I spent a summer in Japan and I made sure to uh, um, grab as many supplies as I could get from their art stores. They are, everything they have is great. Yeah, there's um, there's this, uh, my, my sister lives in Jersey and there's this uh, Japanese paper store there. And we went there once and I've like, I dream of going back there. <laughs> <laughs> for 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 all their manga and like their art supplies and mm-hmm. um i wonder if i could get like could like do a tone and 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 texture 
pieces to put on to. So, mm-hmm. um, but or uh, or Zipatone even would be nice. Well, there's a there's a way to just make your own um, that I figured out. If you if you go and you buy um, a really specific product, um, you can make your own uh, uh, half tones. Um, I forgot I forgot what the material was, but. It's it's worth it considering um, like the cost to like get most of that stuff is really expensive and not really yeah. um, friendly for for most people. Yeah, especially since like, I mean, you can basically do the digital version of that effect pretty. Yeah, I mean, hey, I'm I'm with you. I'm I'm a little bit more uh, traditional than I am digital, but uh, that's just because I'm lazy and stubborn. So yeah, yeah, I uh, I just did my first really big inking digital piece like just this week and it was it was nice it it was nice because it was like I could be a little more uh reckless with my mark um you know because you could just like (laughs) tap the screen twice and it goes away (laughs) so so that's nice but I do like the you got to commit when you got real ink I, I gotta say, um, Bradley, I, I really like what you're uh, drawing so far in Magma Studios too. Thank you. Yeah, really, the, really nice cross hatching. I haven't thought about uh, what the goose fruit is really going to be like mm. for this project yet, and mm. uh, and yet very nice learning about those um, the barnacle trees is a medieval tradition or, or medieval misunderstanding, uh, and I thought it'd be really fun to come up with these th- these alien fruits that really are these barnacle trees with goose fruit that hatch out of them that they can then surf down the uh, mountainside with them. So what if it's the shell and not the fruit itself that they use for their canoes or whatever? Because I know like, uh, well, sure. being here here in Georgia, uh, we have pecan trees and you have like this big ball yeah. of the tree and then it splits open and the part that splits open splits into, you know, basically a canoe shape. So. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I was almost thinking like like a like a surfboard um, uh-huh. uh, that they kind of like ride on. I'm I'm also like a little bit outside of the uh, of the loop on a lot of stuff. I, I haven't really been able to put a whole lot of time and energy into um, this, so I, I might be like a little bit uh, don't know what I'm doing. So oh, <laughs> fair yeah. warning. Oh no no no. So the 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 surfboards are a medium of for getting them from the high ground where they pick the fruit. Um, through the story device of, of encountering the bruise black for the first time. It comes rushing down the, the uh, outer edge of the, the caldera, pouring down a valley towards what eventually will be the drain. And it whisks away uh, the character that we uh, mentioned earlier that Kevin Curley was working on. Um, we, we still haven't named him. What, Robbie, do you remember your name that you came up with? Is this wire X? <laughs> yes, the first one, the one that Kevin had. Uh, Zubu. Zubu, okay. So potentially Zubu goes zipping down the bruise black, whisked away, and Thunk is very heroic, grabs one of the the, um, the goose fruit that they're carrying and rides on the blue, bruise black as, a, as a, a river trying to catch him. And the others follow suit, grabbing their own goose fruit that they all pile on and roll down the hillside with. So oh, it's, you know. Thunk is the character that becomes the mace, correct? Yeah, Thunk is the one that becomes the mace, yeah. Okay. And so like Robbie's idea with the canoes coming out is great. We just have to figure out how to break that down in a panel. It's like that, the, uh, that storytelling concept, um, adding the, the shell to it uh, is going to create a, a, a visual handoff that we have to give the reader to, to see that they, they are um, husking the fruits then to get those shells that they carry out since the device is that they um, are moving these fruits back to their village for the celebration kind of in this thing that they um, rarely do whenever the goose fruits are ripe. Oh. I'm finding this uh, Iago setting off the mousetrap contraption against the bruise black to be inspiring me right now. Like I'm sort oh, yeah. of riffing on this tree house festooned with Rube Goldberg. <laughs> Down the road when we know what they really look like, it'd be cool to have them sprinkled in the background sort of foreshadowing, you know, like Mm -hmm. little shells of them here and there, bits of this and that. And hey, uh, I'm being lazy, I'm not drawing. (laughs) If you, we're seeing the the screen share of the typing right now. Oh, thank you. 
Oh yeah, can we share the? Yeah, there we go. The magma. Of course. Make for. I thought it was still work. sharing the tab after I moved over. <laughs> yeah, there we go. So that way, the video feed that I get, I can edit into a, a YouTube worthy thing. <laughs> Just staring at small font of like possibly named Iago. Like <laughs> stare at that for ten minutes. It's great content. <laughs> For the record, I said Yego, so that would be Y E G O. <laughs> yeah, you got to make those points uh, stick, or things just change for the better. Yeah, yeah. Ways. If you don't say anything, so so for Yego, do we have um, anything sort of uh, concrete on that, or uh, no? And that's I, I did it on purpose because I didn't want to write everything, and so I, I figured there'd be people that are it's like I know exactly what's going to happen. Well, the just only because... thing that we know is that that's a character that's in denial about what actually happened to um, Zubu. I think I got it right. Did I get it right, Robbie? Yes. Zubu. <laughs> so when Zubu disappears down the drain, they try to they take a, a a roll of string out and they lower Sliver down into the drain to look around. Sliver doesn't find anything, and so they're convinced that Sliver uh, that um, Zubu is gone. So when they get back to the treehouse where the Rube Goldberg machines are all set up everywhere and it's very cartoony and I think like 80s cartoon treehouse mm. that has everything you ever wanted in it. Uh, Black Star. Yeah. And so so when they get, they get back there, they start building a bonfire to mourn the loss of Zubu. But what's our name for the Y? Yeah. Diego. 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 <laughs> Just Diego. think Diego without the D. <laughs> yeah, is in denial. And so that character is up in the treehouse packing when the bruise black comes. So they're isolated from Sliver and Tar. And that creates another separation layer in the story that allows us to splinter and start telling more of Diego's story later. So to mm -hmm. answer Brian, that's as much as I have. So if you have things that you want to um, riff on in the future and build, for, mm -hmm. for them, that's gonna be great. And we can, some of those things happen right in the design of the character. Some of those things we can just work out as we uh, move beyond this first issue. Well, uh, the only thing I was gonna say is um, just thinking of, of Yego and thinking of the term Jaeger um, and seeing how like the character's arc, is, um, I forget like what you had exactly, but was that one that was hope to hopeless or it, it was something like where they, they sort of, yes. they, they grow worse with time compared to everyone else sort of like advancing maybe having them visually look more like a traditional hero type. Um, and then over time, you know, like they're the one who sort of like loses hope that they, they start off looking like, or maybe acting a little bit more kind of like in charge that, that way you'd also have some, um, sorry, some good conflict uh, between uh, that and um, uh, Sliver. Yeah. Um, yeah, becoming a hero. Yeah. And that's the thing too, we have to reunite them because by the end of the story, um, Apennon ends up with just uh, Sliver and uh, Tar, and the others are all altered or gone. Thunk has turned into a mace, and um, Yego is uh, apparently absorbed by the Bruise Black, and um, uh, Zubu. I'm getting better with these names, Robbie. Zubu <laughs> is, uh, is you down are. the <laughs> <laughs> and so we, well, part of the, the thing I wanted to set up was uh, people telling stories about how they get back together, if they do, and how they're transformed. So the... Uh... The Rube Goldberg-esque machines are going to be a little bit different, it seems, than you would see in an 80s treehouse cartoon, just by the sense of like, this is not an earthly landscape. So every time I've seen Rube Goldberg machines, there's like a thimble or a, a watering can or like recognizable earthly objects. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And presumably you wouldn't want too much of that on this world, like every little object should look somewhat different than its earthly counterpart. Yeah, I guess that depends on, on who, see, I just set it out there as a, somebody's gonna love drawing Rube Goldbergs and I didn't think about it anymore. Well, I mean, you've got like chairs and shoes. I mean, there are some things that are gonna be universal, so. 
I'd be cool with whatever. It's kind of, again, that cartoon logic in, in writing is we can, uh, if there's a boot or scissors or whatever, that's all cool with me, you know? <laughs> all right, yeah, I think I'm in this Rube Goldberg thing. I think this is, Am I allowed to stake a partial claim on it? Not that I'm the only one doing it, but that I'm like- Go right ahead. Go for right. it. You know, You're if perfect I'm honest, for it, man. That is, that's your thing. <laughs> kind of the way I wrote this first script was to think, what are things that certain people would like? And your um, cool cat affinity and all that made me think, I'm going to put Rube Goldberg machines in there in hopes that AuthorBot is curious about them. <laughs> so you were You're one of the people- it that I was setting a trap for. So it looks oh, like oh, a, uh, all and into it. A pot. trap, if you will. <laughs> Brian, you got the uh, the fill tool to not spill everywhere. That's, that's yeah, an art. Finally. It's a high art in Magma Studio. It's not very <laughs> fill tool friendly. <laughs> it, it is not. Um... <laughs> Again, digital is not my uh, bag, so I'm um, I, I'm I'm uh, again a little bit um, thrown out a little bit from what I usually do. Uh, but hey, that's okay. I'm 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 just here, you know, doing whatever. Rolling. That's really it's fun. You guys just hanging out and drawing and being creative. Yeah. Can you focus on Matt. Matt, can you share what you've got going on? Yeah, I got a little guy. Um, should I hold it up a little bit? Maybe yeah. Well, uh, hit the um, the screen share, and that you'll dominate if you hit screen okay. share. Um. So I'm kind of. I just went lightly first, just to get get some or some place to go with the ink, and so it's just like a little a little critter who's got some wild hair, a little cape like Kevin's has, and then um, sort of furry pants, and I just kind of like the face. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like, like a, a Susian Admiral Akbar. Yeah, yeah. There's an yeah. There's an Akbar kind of thing going on, kind of like the other one was a little bit, but the hair on top. Sort of reminds like a of a porcupine, almost a, a very soft porcupine. Yeah. Oh yeah, totally like a porcupine. I'm gonna I'm gonna keep going, and if I can, I'm hoping I'll just bust out some watercolors in a second. Oh, right on. So I'm, I don't know how much longer we have. Um, so our strong goal is to end directly as the hour clicks over both of us have to like run at that point. Yep. So, yeah, that's true. That's good for me. No, Gotham, uh, you have something going on there. What's happening? Oh, uh, your, your microphone, it's turned off, Gotham. Oh, sorry. I, someone was talking in the background, so I had it muted. <laughs> um, I, I was just really kind of going for some uh, alien texture. I was kind of thinking, um, tree bark if it looked like uh ben Grimm's skin oh that'd be cool and and then i was even thinking of like if it like i almost was thinking what if it were actually like not plant but but meat and and you and as a thing they like peel off the the bark pieces oh, yeah. to get at the inner parts of it or or something like that or transforms and sheds those outer pieces but then it's kind of this nice like like rocky chitinous like material that you can then use for other things as well sort of like um almost like if the flint tools were made of this instead of actual like stone instead you know so it's it's a sort of a uh, couple of things. I, I was just um, trying to think of what to do with the the upper the the leaves and stuff like that. I want to do something not typical. <laughs> I'm just trying to figure out what. Uh, but that was it. Was just mostly playing with texture and and what might look different uh, for our. So I, so the the idea of the quilt is that it's like a it's a patchwork world, right? Yes. Like kind of. Um, and but but most of the action takes place in the crater. Actually, uh, they're climbing to the end. Uh, by the end of the first issue, they'll be at a, a pass through, and they're exiting the crater. And Apennon has to kind of take them with her. Uh, our idea was to move along, and we can always come back to whatever's okay. transformed there. But um, John and I really wanted to just kick things off with a bang, 
take a, a group of characters, show them going through a, a tumultuous transformation, and then say, okay, gang, anything's possible. Let's do this. The crater is like the Shire. Yeah, okay. that's a good, good <laughs> Wow. Uh, so, so it should be the most visually welcoming. Right. Yeah. yeah. yeah for the yeah, reader. Because it's, really it's home. It's that's the right. return of home place, right? Yeah, exactly. It's, that's what I it's the place they return home to, but can't return home because the trip has changed them so much. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Tragedy. And now, you know, they can hunt all the monsters, but in the end, there'll be one left. Them. Ah. Oh, my God. <laughs> all right. So for this uh, treehouse thingy, I mean, this is this is very rough. The picture will look different later. But the idea is they've learned to do all this Rube Goldberg stuff by like harvesting what water they get in the crater. So there's a bunch of complex systems of like living plant tubes and water strainers and stuff like that, watering all their plants, basically. Like oh, an no. overly complicated watering system and they take that skill and apply it to other areas of their home. Oh yeah, oh, that's cool. Yeah. Overly complicated watering system sounds like the exact kind of thing these characters would, would provide <laughs> themselves. <laughs> I I love these. They're so cute. There's a um. There's a real. Uh, has anyone read uh, uh, Busick's uh, Autumn Lands uh, Tooth and Claw series? No, I haven't. I, I, it's uh, Ben Dewey is on the art, and Jody Belair does the color, so it's amazing. Uh, but it's it's Kurt Busiek, and I'm like, mm -hmm. my He's first podcast. Yeah. My first my first podcast was about Astro City, so <laughs> like we, well, like yeah, so I'm 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 in it to win it. That was like a, a life changer for me when I when I read Marvels and then um, Astro City, but. Um, he has he had one which um I was a I got lucky and got to interview him a few years ago and he he's like you know he's like well it, I can't be Kirby but I could definitely try my best to do a com commandy story and and so the whole his whole thing is, is like a love letter to to commandy um but it's 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 this beautiful like sort of it's it's all like talking animal world of magic and yet there's this one there's like this big spell they do that causes this huge disaster and and then one of the characters that appears is like this basically techno soldier from a different era that like appears as part of the spell and he's just one of the characters in it but a lot of what you described is like there's a lot of because of the art in it is there's some beautifully lush uh, like and uh, scenery and 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 um, locations throughout it. Like, there's no ugly places <laughs> in in this world apparently. Uh, so this so far, what we've described a lot has made me think a lot about that um, series. I, I recommend it if you want to, um, especially Thanks. for like journeys that have to be taken and transformative and people becoming like finding their destinies and stuff like that. So it is uh, good on that front. I mean, hey, so long as it's written by Busey, that's, uh, that's always good. Uh, he has never disappointed me, so. Yeah. Except for that weird Justice League run he did, but uh, aside from that. Yeah, I mean, he's, uh, he's, he's had his couple of hits and misses for me too. I was like, yeah. That wasn't the best. Oh. It, it reminds me of the time um, uh, during Heroes Con, I went up to Evan Dork and because uh, I'm, I'm a really big fan of his work, and I was saying, <laughs> "Oh man, I love everything you do. Everything is great." And if you ever say that to Evan Dork, and he has the same reply, which is like, "Oh, you haven't read Mad Dog," then like, like he's it'll just like start to list like books that he like thinks are, are awful that he's done. And it's like, "Oh, I I have no clue what I'm talking about." But. <laughs> Yeah, Mad Dog's not great. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, you know what? Bill and Ted, pretty pretty good book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Seahorse, yeah, I love what you're up to. Bradley. Hey, I yeah. didn't even... I feel a little bit just hackneyed with it because I didn't think it through. I, I purposely kind of didn't think about the barnacle fruit. But yeah. uh, I realized I got in this blank spot of, well, I have to draw something today. I didn't didn't plan for that. I was too busy doing video editing and stuff. 
Uh, looks like that, a goose in a sarcophagus. Yeah, yeah I'm drawing that, barnacle fruit. Just that it's really lovely that the top one, that kind of almond shape, it's just really pretty. Yeah, that's the, like a the hatchet one fish. Following. The one down here feels like a train wreck, but up there, I'm pretty happy with that one. Yeah, I love that. I, <laughs> yeah, I, mean, that, I love both. The goose fruit one looks amazing. Like it, it definitely looks like uh, it looks like an animal. Yeah. As well as like a fruit. So that's the best part about it. It's like. Yeah, is it playing that edge of things? And then you got to, I guess you have to imagine what do they look like riding on it? And I suppose that plays out pretty well because you can see them kind of hang out on top. <laughs> riding oh, down the, the water with it. Sort of the uh, melding of visual categories seems to be happening a lot with a lot of stuff on the quilt. Like, is it plant or is it animal? Is it uh, is it yeah. earthly or is it otherworldly? Is it barren or is it fruitful? And like, <laughs> the the answer depends on who you ask, what panel it is. Well, a tree and, with fleshy bark, and we could have characters that are a patchwork. Yeah. Yeah, I I've been thinking about a design for a, a either a bad guy or antihero that that's kind of like a, a sort of patchwork of of different influences. I um, can't wait to do the Crystal Stormtroopers. <laughs> oh yeah. Okay, so actually that's a question because the the design I was thinking about actually uses some crystalline elements in it. Like, so what what's the deal with the Crystal Stormtroopers? I have no clue. Uh, oh. I, I have <laughs> is that been, as is uh, that as far as the deal is? Crystal stormtroopers. Yeah. Well, I think Brian and Robbie were both part of the crystal push last week. So, yeah, uh, I think they're spearheading the crystal ideas. Again, oh, I, I haven't had um, as much time recently to put into this, so now I'm going to try to like really quickly draw what I thought it would look like. <laughs> yeah. Well, let me, let me get rid of this weird squid thing. I'm in Team Crystal, so <laughs> <laughs> nice. Crystal My original eye. plan was to end flat at the hour, but uh, let's give people like a, literally two minutes to wrap up what you're on because I think we're, uh, well, I think case, a lot yeah. of people are almost done with really good ideas. I would hate to cut that off. And if you want to submit some of your ideas into the Discord, um, we, I'll try to assemble those into some posts, say on Instagram, or integrate them if I can into the video footage that we have. That'll help uh, make the coverage seem uh, hopefully worthwhile to people. On oh, this, yeah. I, on, I thought that was really cool to see slideshow stuff going on as we're chatting and things. Yeah. Yeah, the videos have been very good. They've been very... Uh, I think all my YouTube watching now is like, is it about making comics or reviewing comics? Then I don't want to watch it. <laughs> Otherwise... <laughs> So it's been good to have more to do than just the few channels I've been watching a ton of as of late. Well, it's been great watching you guys draw. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's nice seeing what everyone does. Usually you're, you're right in the thick of it, Robbie. I've been pacing, so you know. <laughs> <laughs> I drew plenty this morning. Sure did. Well, here's my awful crystal soldier that's unfinished, but um, this does not make any sense when I'm drawing. But hey, that's okay. It's got a nice. Uh, I, I like the look. It's, it reminds me of. There's at least. At least one kind of more very heavily crystalline character in a Copra, Michelle Fife's Copra. That's oh, yeah. Oh, that's, that's totally what I'm doing. Oh, man. Nice. Yeah. And Which, that's a good style, too, because it bounces back and forth amongst different art style, um, artist styles. Yeah. Um, and that, so I'm like, it, it's versatile, and different people will inter interpret that very different ways. Like, I think uh, John Osborne will have a very, um, uh, fractal approach to coloring it and there'll be a lot of light source happening and mm -hmm. then someone else can do it in a very flat style where the, the colors will will play really evenly across the different crystal surfaces 
And so it's, it's a look that a lot of people can do and make it their own. And yet it always will read as these crystalline things coming out of, mm -hmm. I guess, out of a, the bruise black. Yeah. Oh, I just got a really cool idea. Um, if, if like their, their bodies themselves are living weapons and having be that um, they can fire like energy uh, out of their hands um, and then like it would glow. I, I'm getting a frozenness. Yeah, Brian. Yeah. Before and like shooting it. Uh, sorry. It's okay. Sounded like you were going somewhere good with that, but we just heard warble. <laughs> I'm a, an adult from uh, Peanuts. Yes, yes. The crystal and soldier will womp, womp, womp. Oh, um, Their hands, like whatever. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I was trying to say that like their their body parts they can like use as weapons and that they can like vibrate different colors and fire out like energy. Whoa, that's sick. And that kind of matches the 80s cartoon vibe that is sort of integrating. Like, oh no, it's the crystal soldiers. <laughs> yeah. You can Which easily get rid of them, kill them, it doesn't matter. There's always gonna be more. <laughs> this makes me want to go dig up some of the of um uh, Crystar Marvel. Yeah. Uh, 80s uh, attempt at, at uh, instead of doing it uh, instead of making comics for someone else's toy line let's make our own toy line and make the comics to go with it and yeah. you know, so, oh yeah. those those remco toys uh, <laughs> but that clear crystal was plastic was kind of cool okay. I, I actually was i always thought it looked really striking on the on the shelves whenever i saw it oh yeah all right bradley you want to give us an outro and then we'll wrap this up and i'll send the recording Sure. Um, thanks for joining the Indie Comic Union. We've been working on the uh, quilt, a collaborative comic made by the members who are participating from the Indie Comic Union. Um, this time we've been working on the, uh, see if I can get it right, the Crater Critters. I did it. <laughs> you did it. <laughs> Robbie, what were the names of our two new characters? Zubu and Yego. Zubu and Yego, that kind of got assigned. Uh, we've been developing some things to, uh, uh, about the look of the crater, uh, about the, uh, the flora and fauna that exists there, and even some discussions of the crystal warriors and the uh, Rube Goldberg machines that will populate the treehouse. So there was some good progress to be had, and uh, we'll be uh, convening again soon. And our next up video is going to be all about the character that we did not talk about today from the Critter Craters, Thunk, the transforming uh, metal character. I hope you join us. Remember to like and subscribe. Hey, yeah, we don't have hey, to Connor do go. that. That was a pretty good one. Looks like Robbie's our alternate Connor. <laughs> smash that, smash that bell, smash that like button. <laughs> All right.